Welcome to AB Talks. Climate change, growing global polarization, the threat of artificial intelligence to employment, and the evolving nature of leadership. Oh, and we've got a pandemic to deal with. In 2021, it is a complicated world out there. So how is an organization to adapt to this new landscape, particularly if you're the one supposed to be advising others on how to evolve and thrive? Well, at PwC, they've responded by launching the new equation, a global strategy designed to tackle each of these issues head on. And today I'm delighted to be joined from the US by Bob Moritz, the global chairman of PwC. Morning, Bob. Thanks for joining us on AB Talks this morning. Great to be with you here today, Scott. So looking forward to the conversation. So I'm going to start, which can, it feels like the most simple question, but it's probably actually quite a difficult one to answer, which is, can you give me a brief helicopter view of what the new equation is? How long have you been working on it and why was it necessary? There's a lot in there, but I'll try my best. Exactly. First and foremost, as we look at the world, the mega trends that are evolving and the implications from it, it's clear that today's system is not fit for purpose going forward. You identified a number of different challenges. Those are symptoms of that system actually potentially failing us as a society and a world. When you step way back, what we see is two fundamental themes that business leaders, political leaders, government leaders, community leaders have to deal with. First is the issue of enhanced trust. The entire system needs more trust within it for it to operate effectively and efficiently, especially with those challenges that you talked about. Mm -hmm. The second piece is we can't be focused on just programs and talk. We actually have to be focused more so on sustained outcomes, outcomes that benefit the stakeholders that are interested. Interested in what are the implications to those themes that you identified at the start of your program. And those two themes are interdependent. They're not siloed in any way, shape, or form. You need to actually demonstrate the sustained outcomes before you are more trusted. If you are more trusted, you probably have had the confidence instilled on you by others that they believe you in fact will deliver on those sustained outcomes. So as we look at those two fundamental needs, the third component piece is what PwC is doing about it, which is we have to build our capabilities and scale sufficiently enough, all of those competencies to come together in a community of solvers to solve for those problems. and solve for those opportunities, i.e. the enhanced trust and mm -hmm. the sustained outcomes. So at PwC, we're arguing that by bringing all of those companies together through the humanity that we have and the IP that's in people's heads, coupled with technology empowerment, that we are able to position to uniquely advise and provide the assurance necessary to bring that trust to life. Let's start with trust because you, know, you finished there, you started with trust and you finished there with trust. Um, where did the trust go? I mean, and, and how vital is it to build that right now? Because it does feel like there's a real gap in trust kind of around the world right now. You know, what's fueled that? Uh, uh, and why is it so important to tackle that? Yeah, absolutely. So first and foremost, trust is just fundamental to actually getting things done. As you look at things in the marketplace, things with the politics, things in, in various countries and communities that's going on right now. But let's go back to some of those mega trends I referred to earlier. If you combine technology with the fact that the shifting demographics of the world and the like have caused the asymmetry of the haves and the have nots, three fundamental things have happened. First, there's a lot more transparency. The world sees a lot of what's going on now through social media and otherwise. Something might have happened in Africa 10 years ago. You would have never heard about it, or maybe you would have heard about it a month later. Yeah. Today, there's a picture taken and it's instantaneously broadcast around the world. Yeah. The second point is the number of stakeholders that now have that voice through social media and otherwise, the world has become judge and jury, not mm -hmm. necessarily the direct individuals. And likewise, what you've got is a bunch of polarization because you do have the haves and the have nots. So the demands from the stakeholders are increasing. And oh, by the way, they're not aligned. So as a result, everyone brings a degree of skepticism and therefore lack of trust to what you're doing, but most importantly, why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And they're not seeing the sustained outcomes that actually benefit the world in the way they believe they should come to life. So it's no surprise that we're getting this deterioration of trust. To your second point, enhancing that is so much more important. We, we look around the world today, how do you get stuff done? Yeah. For the politician, 
It's how do I get elected? Well, I've got to demonstrate that I can get to some outcomes and do something, not just talk about it. To, to the CEOs, if I'm going to actually attract investment, consumption, or even employment, I've got to be more trusted that I'm actually delivering against the goods versus the expectations that those three, particularly those three groups have in the, at the end of the day. I mean, when you break it down, of all the issues you're trying to tackle in this master plan, it almost feels like that's the hardest one to tackle because the other ones are kind of physical manifestations or they're physical things to get your hands on or they're training and that sort of thing. Whereas this is something that you really, you, you need to get in and it seemed almost an impossible task. Um, how do you I don't it? think it's, I don't think it's impossible, but this is where these two things become so much more interconnected. Yeah. So let's take a business today. A business today has historically been challenged by delivering net income and delivering the expectations against that, against that stakeholder group called a shareholder. Yeah. As we move and shift towards shareholder cap, or stakeholder capitalism, it's clear that the activism yeah. that historically has been resting within the investor group is not just limited to that anymore. The, the, the employees are becoming activists. Mm. The consumers are becoming activists. Oh, by the way, the citizens in, in the locations where these places are actually housed is becoming activists in terms of demanding more, in terms of what are you doing around climate or what are you doing around social injustice or what are you doing around the issues of you know, uh, fair equity pay, for example. So, so in order to be more trusted by that group, those groups, you've got to deliver the goods. Right? This is why that sustained outcome piece becomes so more important. So if you look today, our own CEO survey around the world will tell us, yes, there's many more commitments, for example, in ESG, in environment. But we haven't taken the necessary actions to, live, to deliver that. And we're not talking about the actions. We're actually talking about the results. It's not good enough to just have the program. You've got to actually demonstrate the outcomes. And that's why that transparency, right, this concept of trust, it's around trust, transparency, and accountability that allows us to potentially enhance the trust that we have today. You, yeah, you touched upon there, you talked about climate change and the environment. Um, that feels right now um, like it's finally getting traction in the world. As you say, in the corporate world, ESG, sustainability. Um, how much of this is you trying to catch up with that conversation? Or are you indeed trying to lead that conversation and walk the walk as well as talk the talk because it does you know there are there are accusations of companies around the world just treating esg as a box ticking exercise to say oh look i've got green credentials it, it is this you trying to lead the way and lead by example it's a bit of both scott the reality is you do have a number of enlightened leaders that understand this and are trying to take action on this in a meaningful way and mm -hmm. our job is to help advise them in terms of the twists and turns as they take that journey. But there are others that still need more help. So we are trying to lead the way both in terms of raising the challenge, but also to describe the opportunity to get them to understand it more so, but also to make sure that they are, well, I'll call it jumping in with both feet now yeah. in terms of the actions they need to take. And this is going to come at them one way or the other. We're trying to get them ahead of the curve, right? The reality is the investing base is starting to take these into consideration. If you talk to any CEO and CFO now, probably within the top five questions that an equity analyst or a credit creditor is asking is, where are you on climate change? And, and demonstrate to me both the progress you've made, and then I'm going to judge you on a comparable basis against your benchmark group. So that pressure is coming regardless. We're trying to get organizations best prepared for that, to solve for that, and to get ahead of that curve based upon right. what's happening. Does that then connect back to the first point you're making where these organizations have to be trusted on that issue? Uh, to, talk, to talk about that a bit further then, uh, I mean, you're a global organization, and I know you've, uh, there's a series of commitments in uh, the new equation, one of those to be net zero. As a global organization, that can't be easy. How, you know, you obviously require some travel. How do you achieve net zero? Yeah. <clears throat> so just like any business, we've got a role and responsibility to play in terms of engaging, contributing to society and, and delivering against our stakeholder expectations. Um, so our own commitment 
and we've made several now as we think about not only just um, the E in ESG, but also what we're doing in the digital and upskilling space, for example, yeah. um, which we could talk about later. Yeah. But in, in the case of climate, yes, we've made our own commitment to be net zero by 2030. It's an aggressive plan. There's four fundamental themes. It's how do we actually operationalize our offices and the day-to-day -day interactions that our people have, not only in the office, but also getting to the office in terms of your own personal footprint. The second piece is how do you move towards more renewable energy as you think about the use of energy more broadly? Third, you have to actually think about your supply chain more broadly. Every individual supply chain that you've got a piece of or are connected to, you've got to be thinking about how we're going to work with those individual organizations to make some change. And the last one is actually how do we think about the future of work? Mm -hmm. A lot of our work is based upon some element of travel. It's not to say that that travel goes away in any way, shape, or form, but working with the airline industries to more be more effective and efficient in terms of when we choose to travel and how we choose to travel is really, really important. So it's those four levers of change. But as you said, it's got to be done at the local level, and there's a lot of granularity in that, a lot of detail. And that's where people are typically underestimating the amount of effort that is necessary to make this come to life. It's easy to make a commitment. Our job is to help them actually get to that granular detail at the local level to get the changes and ultimately the outcomes they're looking for. Is there anything that you've learned during the pandemic and coronavirus that has either accelerated practices or shown you different ways that you can operate to reduce travel and, and can operate to reduce your carbon footprint? Well, look, I, I think the reality is you've got to look at this with a half full and a half empty approach right now, right? So COVID and, and the pandemic was a huge strategy from a health perspective. When you think about the number of people that have been affected, yeah. um, there are some silver linings coming out of that. Let's go first to the, the realities, right? COVID accelerated all the trends that you talked about early on yeah. and put a bright spotlight on them in a big time way and also talked about the interdependency of them. The second thing, though, is it did force the world to recognize they could leverage technology at a much faster pace than they thought, and everybody could accelerate very quickly. The question is, what's the right balance? Yeah, There's got to be a, a humanity to it because no one wants to be stuck inside the four walls every single day without that human intervention. And if you don't have that intervention, you're going to miss out on you know, cultural change, innovation, teamwork, a simulation of talent, and for that matter, implementation of large change programs. So you've got to actually find the right balance. And that's the issue now in terms of the learnings, which is what is it you need to be in an office for? What is it that you need to actually be physically connected to someone for? And that's where actually the lessons learned around, let's be specific around when and what type of work yeah. and work processes can be done solo at home or wherever on a digital basis. And what are really required to actually be connected to people in an office or in a location that might require some travel to get there. How important is it for you know, organizations to avoid the temptation to kind of reset to default? You know, they obviously went in with one set of behaviors into the pandemic, uh, had to adapt and evolve during uh, the lockdown, and then they come back and everyone's coming back to the office to kind of reset. Is it important to try and uh, identify um, what lessons, you know, what should we keep and what should we then adapt rather Absolutely. than just go back to the old way of doing things? Yeah, without a doubt. Look, the, the reality is, as hard as this pandemic was for the business community and governments, it was relatively easy to make a hard decision, which mm -hmm. was you got to work from home. Yeah, you have to do it. You have no choice. Now, the question is coming out of that. How do you make the decisions in terms of when to come back, how to come back, how much to come back? And this is going to be, candidly, a good case study over the next two to three years. If anybody says they have the answer today, I'm going to argue they're wrong. They're going to learn along the way. They're going to pilot along the way. They're going to fail along the way. And they're going to hopefully adjust very quickly along the way in terms of the experiments that are going to be ongoing as you start to come out of this process. So my advice to a lot of people as, as PwC and our advice to other organizations is you've got to actually think about this in a much different way in terms of what you want that world to be. And, and more importantly, why you want it to be that. For some, it may be a cost play. So let's let's try to figure out a way to minimize this. Another, we're losing on culture or losing on a simulation of talent. The other one is going to be right now, as we see, especially with people, they've had a chance over the last 15 months to reflect deeply on what their career looks like over time and what's most important to them. So coming back to work might be a big challenge for many of them. So that's some of the challenges that organizations are going to deal with coming out of this, which again goes back to that, are you listening to your stakeholders being your people? And are you able to attract that talent in a post-pandemic world 
in a way that actually attributes to your strategy and the trust and the outcomes you're looking to achieve. Now, when I was young, I read Stephen King's It, and it was the scariest book I'd read as a child. In 2020, I read a book that was scarier than that, which was 10 Years to Midnight by your global head of strategy, Blair Shepard. Uh, in that, he described climate change as one of the fast and massive issues that we need to tackle within a decade, or it'll be too late. Do you subscribe to Blair's quite stark warning on that? Absolutely. Um, look, Blair and we, as we went through our own strategy review over the last 18 months, talked about these trends that are embedded within Blair's book. Yeah. And you can look at them half empty or you can look at them half full. I think the, the challenge is going to be which side of the fence you're on. It's going to be based upon the decisions that we take over the next couple of years. The good news on climate change is you really, for the first time ever, are seeing the combination of politicians, government leaders, community leaders, and the business community now at the table having yeah. these conversations with energy and urgency. And that's a good thing. Now the question is, okay, let's take that talk to the walk and the walk to the outcomes that they're trying to achieve and get the results over the next couple of years. The good news, we are seeing that momentum build and build pretty quickly. You also see all elements of change come to life, meaning, so if you're gonna drive the change, the backend reporting for accountability is important. If you're gonna do the backend reporting, are you changing incentives in the boardroom for your management teams in terms of how they get rewarded? The yeah. whole system is starting to change. Yeah. Likewise, are we seeing governments put rules and regulations in place to further accelerate that to ensure both the long-term prosperity, but also a meaningful transition? And it's important here that we don't move so fast, but rather manage the transition as we think about the world we're in today versus the world we need to be in tomorrow. To continue with Blair's book, then, the other massive and fast issue he pointed out was AI and the unintended consequences of technology and what that could mean for the global workforce. Um, it looks in your new equation that you are trying to train a, a generation of uh, employees that can use these tools rather than be replaced by these tools. How important is that for you as an organization? But equally, how vital is it that the world kind of looks and learns in this space? Because otherwise, we're going to have a lot of people out of work around the world. And when then we know what happens in terms of polarization and dissatisfaction and, and, the, and the consequences of that. Yeah, the, the realities of technology and the downstream implications are real. And they create major risks, but those risks can be managed and turned into an opportunity. Yeah, We've seen that at PwC. So three years ago, we already saw that trend coming. We landed our own, what we called New World New Skills Initiative. We dedicated $3 billion towards that, which was the combination of upskilling our own people, which I'll come back to in a moment, yeah. helping our clients upskill, and then helping the world upskill. And on that latter one, we actually had to do so with other organizations, with public-private partnerships, for example, we're part of a, an organization called Gen U, which is very specifically focused on upskilling the youth of the world today to create the opportunities for them individually and collectively tomorrow. Let's come back to the, what does it mean to be focused on upskilling? Mm -hmm. The lessons learned for us was not just upskilling on tech. It was to create a mindset of lifelong learning and the continuation of that learning. So as you saw in the launch of the new equation, not only are we continuing our digital upskilling, we're actually skilling people in ESG, right? So they got to make sure that they understand that world that they're living in regardless, not, not just have subject matter experts in it. Now let's go to the digital upskilling. The digital upskilling had three component pieces to it. First was to actually give them the skills to code and create the apps, the bots, et cetera, to change things in a big time way. The second was how do you actually adopt technologies faster to improve your work and your life? Yeah. And third is how do you enhance the leadership skills necessary to drive that kind of change and manage and lead through that change? And that's probably the hardest of all of them. What we found coming out of this, Scott, was that by doing so, giving our people access to these skills and in essence, creating a contract with them where we'll help skill you. We're not going to guarantee the job, but we are going to likely have an opportunity for you to have work. Might yeah. be different, but work available to you that hopefully your skills match that. That's the opportunity. Now, what came out of that was an amazing amount of innovation. 
what came out of that was a lot of effectiveness and efficiency that got redeployed in terms of new opportunities, both for people and for PwC. What came out of that was new products and new services and innovation and entrepreneurship. And that's what the world needs. So let's go back now to what the world needs. Not only do we need to actually upskill people, we actually have to, that's the supply side. We have to think about the demand side, which is if we don't have the entrepreneurship to demand those skills and those resources. We're going to have an even bigger mismatch going forward. Yeah. And that's where governments and business have to come together to think about the supply side, i.e. skilling, and the entrepreneur side in terms of job creation and to get the matching going to allow for that risk that you described to be an opportunity for the world going forward. I'm interested because, I mean, I read Blair's book last year and he obviously spent a long time writing that book. As your head of strategy, did, did, his, did the thinking of his team come first and then PwC had to follow that? Or were they, was it kind of one process? Because you, obviously, if you've got a global head of strategy out there calling for global change, you as an organization have to be embracing global change. Yeah, uh, it was all part of the, the um, effort here. The reality is we've been looking at these megatrends for the last six or seven years. Uh, we got them right in terms of where the world has gone. What we missed was how fast they're going to move yeah. and the interdependency and the complexity associated with them all. But Blair's book was just the catalyst to get an external point of view out there as we thought about the basis for launching our strategy and what we needed to do as an organization not only to invest in, to be ready for that world, to help organizations in the world deal with it, but also to make sure that we're creating that sense of awareness. Our job is not only to help organizations deal with this, not only by the role modeling we need to do, i.e. we should be our own use case, but also yeah. help others. But likewise, we got to actually convene the world and collaborate with the world to make this happen. So there's a leadership responsibility we have to convene the right people to have the right kind of dialogues. We don't have all the answers, but through that dialogue, hopefully we can get to better answers than we have today. You should ask my wife. She's always right on everything. So, um, I mean, it's a hugely ambitious plan. You know, you've got multiple disciplines. You've got all sorts of different pillars. Do you genuinely believe that you can achieve everything you set out? Or is this a stretch target? Will the effort be its own reward? Because you as an organization will push yourself down a road that you wouldn't have necessarily traveled on. Listen, the, the measures of success we'll see over the next couple of years, but um, an organization like PwC that's got 170 years of history, which historically has been very responsive and change agile to the world and what it needs, I have confidence in our people. We have great people that do great stuff. And, and Blair is just one example of that with the book that he launched to sort of yeah. identify these issues. So my confidence level is very high. So is it ambitious? Absolutely. Is it game changing for us? Absolutely. Does it change the game in terms of our brand? We hope so right, in terms of what we are known for and how we can help organizations achieve what they need to achieve in the area of trust and sustained outcomes combined together. There is a, a reality of can we execute on this? And that's why it was so important for us to land investment requirements and to exemplify the couple of examples. And there'll be more coming over the next couple of years and months for that matter, in terms of the things that we will do differently. And that was important for us as we announced this to identify a few of those things, to tell the world we're serious about this, we're committed to this, we've got a conviction on it, and the entire leadership team is very much aligned. It's exciting for us, for all of our people, and hopefully for our stakeholders as well. It's a simple statement, but in a number of areas in business, um, I, I keep talking with business leaders, and there, there seems to be a resistance to this, but is it simply better for the bottom line ultimately to do the right thing? Absolutely. These things are not exclusive. Doing good and doing well for the bottom line actually are very interdependent. It's just a question of time before time catches up. So, so let me give you a real example. Yeah, please. Today, to today's organizations have to attract the right talent. Everyone is worried about, can I find the right talent that want to come to my organization to achieve my strategic objectives? It's one of the top 10 risks every single year PwC does its CEO survey. The reality is if you're not focused on ESG, you're going to lose the opportunity to actually attract talent. The only option you're going to have is to actually pay them more, which is going to have a bottom line implication. And yeah. you can't pay them enough because at the end of the day, the pay actually gets offset by the values you're better off actually demonstrating the value proposition. So if you're attracting that talent because you've done the right thing in the world of ESG and your yeah. value is aligned to other people, then you're going to have that access to talent. But if not, eventually the cost is going up. The people aren't coming. You're not going to be able to deliver. A couple of years from now, it's going to catch up from you and you're not going to be able to get investment. You're not going to be able to get market cap. 
you're going to lose your brand, you're going to lose the bottom line, and management's out of business. And, and that's, you know, as we tie these two things together, there's so much more independency now. Likewise on climate, if you're not doing what's needed, investment's not going to come to you. The inv institutional investors are walking away, starting to make distant decisions. Insurance organizations, banks are making different decisions. You're not going to have the capital you need to actually deploy. So if you're not bringing these two things together, I think you failed. And that's a fundamental change. This is not so polarizing in terms of you got to do one or the other. You actually yeah. have to do both. I mean, we saw evidence of this last night in the European Championships, didn't we, with Ronaldo and the bottle of Coca-Cola uh, and the impact that had on their share price. Um, you're also creating these leaderships and you were talking about leaders. And this is something I'm, I'm just I'm absolutely fascinated and obsessed with kind of the future of work, the future of the workplace. You're creating these new leadership institute, you know, the leadership institute, sorry. Um, how has the role of the leader changed since, say, you rose to the level of, of leader? And what are you teaching in these new institutes? And do you think you could actually qualify from one of the institutes? So, so, so look, the, the reality is leaders now need to understand better the world that they are operating in. So all the trends you talked about earlier, all the implications of Blair's book, yeah. there's an element of basic foundational knowledge that has to be better understood and then articulated in that local business leader's mindset relevant to their business. How is their business playing a role one way, shape or form in either adding to that agenda or detracting from that agenda? Yeah. So, so awareness is, is the first part. The second part is leaders today have a number of paradoxes, right? A real dilemma in terms of the choices they need to make. So the question becomes not what you're doing, but also articulating why you're doing it. And this goes now to this issue of trust. If you want to be more trusted, not only do you actually have to deliver sustained outcomes, you actually have to be a much better communicator to your stakeholders in terms of, hey, here's what we are doing. Here's the humble nature. We don't have all the answers. We're not perfect yet, but we're definitely demonstrating that progress. And yeah. compared to others, we're actually moving that forward. So awareness around the challenges, actions to be taken to potentially actually change the outcome and the direction and the speed of that directional change. Third is communication skills to how do you do your more trust with the stakeholder community. And finally, let's make sure you really have a good appreciation of the evolution of those stakeholders. And how are you engaging, not talking to them, engaging with them to make sure that you are listening as much as you possibly may to, to make the judgment calls you do at the end of the day. And the last point is, as I said at the very start of this conversation, the whole system needs change. The whole system needs change in business. So how are you coming up with your compensation plans? How are you incenting the right behaviors of your leadership, senior leadership and middle management? That's another challenge. How are you managing your board? to get to those decisions. All yeah. of those complexities are, are now the realities of what a new leader needs to be focused on more so than ever before when it was very easy to sort of take a relatively easy er to take a decision, manage through that decision and deliver good returns that are immediate and short-term in nature. You answered 99% of my question, but you didn't answer 100%. Would you qualify from one of your own leadership institutes these days? Uh, me, myself, personally, I've got a lot of learning to still go on. So I'm learning every single day. The great Excellent. To hear. But I mean, yeah. let's, let's drill down into that you know, just a little bit more, because I think there's something really important there. Um, I mean, we've operated in almost the same sort of hierarchical management style for almost four or five, four or five decades now. Um, is it genuinely now not fit for purpose? And what is the consequence for organizations that don't look at that and go, right, because we're not in a manufacturing, we're, we're, we're less of a manufacturing economy and more of a knowledge economy. Um, so it feels like, you know, if we have machinery, we look after the machinery. Are we good enough yet as a world, as a world of work in looking after this engine of output now? Yeah, what, um, you've, you've raised a couple of points, but uh, first, let's not minimize the manufacturing side of the equation, right? So yes, we're, we're transitioning to a services-based economy, particularly in some parts of the world, more so than others, but there's still a need for and a big value to the manufacturing side of the equation. Yeah. So your point though is um, equally applicable regardless if you're in the services side or the manufacturing side, in terms of how do you think about the engagement, the degree of empathy and the understanding that you have with your stakeholder group, regardless if you're in a production area for manufacturing or services organization. Yeah. The second point is we're not yet there. 
right? And this is where, again, you got to come back to the world needs. Um, Blair's book talks about adopt, right? We talk about some key yeah. words in that when you go to the letters, the asymmetry that's going on, the haves and the have nots. And this is equally applicable to business leaders as it is to government leaders as they think about servicing their citizens, right? Not what it takes to actually get elected, but what does it take to stay in position of power? It actually requires that trust and you better be delivering the outcomes, which means you're minimizing that asymmetry in a big time way. Some inspired leaders are actually doing some of those things to get that stuff done. So I think we've got a lot uh, to move forward. We've got some great leaders. I don't think we can be so uh, easily judged that we're either not there or there. It's very company by company, um, organization to organization, leader to leader mm -hmm. uh, is the way I would describe it today. Uh, but there's definitely opportunities for community to learn. The best leaders are never satisfied, both with their own performance and their team's performance. And that's actually a good thing because they're always learning as well. And what is the, so to come back to that thing, um, what's the downside if they don't change? And you just began to, to touch upon there as the upside if they do change. Yeah, the downside is you're not in a job anymore, <laughs> right? I mean, the, the reality is the world's going to be that judge. Yeah. And that world is judging much faster than ever before, right? We see that with some of the examples and you look at the average tenure of CEO um, experience over the last couple of, or the last decade in particular. Um, so again, to not only survive, but to thrive, you yeah. actually have to actually take advantage of these opportunities in front of you in the way we've just described. What are you most proud of in the new, you know, in, in your new equation? What's the, the, the biggest thing that you personally wanted to tackle that you're proudest to see in this strategy? Yeah, two things come to mind. First is we actually have many of the competencies that we need, we will be investing more so to build scale in them. Mm. So when you think about um, strategy capabilities, when you think about technology and cloud, when you think about people and change, when you think about ESG, we've got them. Um, but what it goes to is what our people are doing with them today. I'm very proud of sort of the results we had over the last five, four or five years or so in terms of our service to society and our service to the clients that we're trying to serve. Um, we, we're always going to be better. I don't, uh, I want to be very humble here and rightfully so. We don't always get it right. We've got to make sure we have the improvements. But as an organization, a number of years ago, we, we made a good decision in terms of redefining our purpose. And we made a great decision in terms of redefining the values that are more important, most important to serve that purpose. And our people bring that to life every day. So very proud of that. The second is the investment and the conviction to make this shift. The leadership team came together in yeah. a COVID world, be it, right? So, yeah. so as I said earlier, trying to do things digitally and not in a room, you can't read the body language. It's hard to actually get people aligned um, on a virtual basis. So the fact that all of our leaders saw the world and the needs it has, and then said, you know what? I'm willing to deploy that capital. Let's remind ourselves we're a partnership. So it's coming out of the partner's pocketbooks eventually. So we got to balance that. That's huge for a leadership team to come together in a period of 15 months in a period of COVID when none of us have physically been in a room together <laughs> to land this. And that, that to me is a huge challenge. And I, 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 the, the organization stepped up in a big time way that I'm very much proud of. How much have you got Zoom fatigue after all of that then? Uh, um, quite a bit. <laughs> you, you, you used two words though when you were talking there, which I, which I found really interesting. You talked about purpose and you talked about values. Um, is the, you know, the corporate world, do we now have to be more than simply p l absolutely um i think organizations as they've thought about the stakeholders that are needed to be served including investors and it's not uh, a minimization of the investor side of the equation there's a recognition that just net income or just gdp is not the right measurement anymore so let's think about what are those right measures of success, financial and non-financial going forward. You see organizations trending in that direction already. Again, the inspired are already moving in that direction. Others will be forced there because rules and regulations are coming and coming very quickly. But yes, I'll call it the, um, the purpose-led organization that are very focused on stakeholders, not just shareholders, I think are, are the ones that are going to be surviving and thriving. And candidly, the ones that are going to be successful are the ones that can move the fastest. It's all about agility and speed not necessarily just the being the biggest all the time. Well, I bump into you into a lift. What's the one question I should ask you? Or what's the one question you wish someone had asked you? Um, I think I'd come back to why now and why PwC? Yeah. 
Yeah, we, we, we look at ourselves and say, look, there's an opportunity here. We've done extremely well over the last number of decades um, in serving society and the like. Um, again, everyone has their bumps along the way, but nonetheless, there's areas for improvement. But uh, we see this moment in time of the world needing a lot of help. We think the combination of all of our capabilities um, in the Middle East or, or around the world are, mm -hmm. are so much so important to organizations. And when we bring that community of solvers and the, and the collective IP of all of PwC, that opportunity, I think, is uniquely positioning us for serving the world well going forward. There does seem to be a good focus as well on the next generation coming through. I looked at the, the PwC Middle East plans, you know, and the, 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 the trainees that you're going to be taking in. Um, it seems an obvious answer, but I'll ask the question anyway. How important is it to engage with that new generation and bring them through and give them opportunities, particularly in a region where we are out here, where you know there are some pockets of really good prosperity, but there's actually a lot of pockets where people do genuinely need opportunity. That's it's absolutely part of the process, right? So, so the reason we went to these public-private partnership concepts of leadership institutes, the reason we've gone to an organization like Gen U, is really about how do we get the youth of today to be the leaders of tomorrow that we need, mm -hmm. and that's really important. So instilling that knowledge, helping them in that transition themselves, I think is a really important responsibility we have and organizations have most generally. Um, one of the other things that you talked about Blair earlier that we asked him to focus on as an organization is actually tying talent management and strategy together. If you don't have the right talent, you'll never achieve your strategy. Yeah. If you don't have the right strategy, you'll never understand what you need in terms of your people. So those two things go hand in hand. And that's a big opportunity for, I think, any organization to be thinking more about strategy and talent management collectively together as they think about the world in front of them. I mean, Blair described himself, even despite the fact he wrote a very worrying book, um, he describes himself as an eternal optimist. And he said he was very optimistic. What are you optimistic about? Look, take a look at the last 15 months, how the world came together to solve the biggest challenge we faced in you know, a lifetime. That, that innovation, that collective work demonstrated that the world isn't necessarily going to rely on this fragmented nationalization kind of approach going forward, right? When, so, so, so the world needed to work together. Yeah. Is it there? Is it reality? Absolutely. Um, I'm just hopeful when I look at the examples of the kind of projects that we have done, the kind of contributions our people have made, the kind of innovation that's coming out of that. Think about that digitization example I gave you previously. The amount of new ideas that came out of just giving people access to skills, to data, and permission to innovate, mm -hmm. wow, that world is full of opportunities. The only question is, can we scale those opportunities even bigger to have the impact that world needs, not just PwC needs, but the world needs. Bob, Maritz, thank you so much for your time. I and mean, we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours, but you've got to get busy because you've got a massive strategy to implement. Um, good luck in delivering it. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure to be with you here today, Scott. Thanks for the conversation.